Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the stories that brought you here. It's the podcast dedicated to the stories of the people from Pender Island, British Columbia. Once again, I'm your host, Chris Wakaluk, and I will be sitting down in one-on-one hour-long conversations discussing the stories that brought people to this educational little island we live on, and also to hear the stories that brought people to the point that they're at in their lives right now. Today, I'm lucky enough to say that I have a pretty unique interview because this interview is with an individual who has spent the last 19 years living on and off the island, and she has had quite a profound impact on the island because for the past 19 years, she has been the kindergarten teacher at Pender Island's elementary school. This woman, of course, is Helen Mason. Now, just to give some context to this interview as well, too, is that Prior to doing the interview, I had never met Helen in person. I had just heard that she was retiring from being the kindergarten teacher, and I thought that it would be a wonderful opportunity to get to honor somebody who's really had such an impact on so many kids' lives on the island, and thus so many people's lives on the island. And the way the timing worked out to do this interview is kind of amazing because This interview took place two days before Helen was retiring from her 41-year teaching career, which is amazing. So in this interview, we definitely touch on Helen's teaching career, but we also talk about her family's somewhat lengthy history with Pender Island. We also hear a little bit about Helen's Scottish heritage, and also Helen talks about her connection with the Aboriginal community through her teaching that really had a profound impact on her life. So there you go. Now, without further ado, here is my interview with Helen Mason. Helen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Fantastic. We just talked very briefly before we began and had a nice dinner with some lamb sausages. Good Scottish supper. (laughs) Good Scottish supper. Fantastic. All right. Yeah. Anyway, well, let's lead into the traditional first question here, which is uh, what brought you to Pender Island? That actually is a question that has a very long answer because the road here took place over many years. My mom and dad were immigrants from Scotland. They came in uh, my father in 1947 and my mother in 49. They lived in Vancouver, and my father had two gas stations there, and they decided to make a trip to Pender Island, which my father knew about because he had been studying weather systems throughout the world and had determined that the weather in the Gulf Islands was about the best uh, all-round weather experience in the world, according to his estimation. So they came uh, to Pender with my uh, oldest sister, who was a baby at that time, and went to visit Mrs. Aldridge. Mrs. Aldridge was looking for a handyman, and my father thought that he might be interested in that as a change of occupation, but he rethought that, and and it was really just a a fleeting uh, idea. However, his trip to Pender uh, convinced him that he did, in fact, want to buy a piece of property on the Gulf Islands and specifically Pender Island. He went home to Vancouver and it took another year or so. So in approximately 1952, he bought a small farm and some waterfront uh, property in uh, Browning Harbor, which my mother uh, owns to this day. And on that first trip to Pender, he met um, some of the old timers that uh, people may know the names of, uh, Mrs. Aldridge, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Menzies. At that time, Pender had a very small population. I think I understand that there were about 300 people who lived on Pender year-round. And then it swelled in the summertime uh, with, even then, we had tourists who came. That's how the property uh, came into my family. And then every year after, and I was born in 1953, so every year after, wherever we lived, our family came to Pender Island to spend the summer. And um, often my father would have to go back to work, but my mother and, and brother and sisters would stay on Pender for the entire summer. 
And we traveled from various uh, locations because my father was in the Air Force when we moved. We lived in different locations in Canada. And so two years, we traveled from as far as Prince Edward Island. Uh, but we also lived in Ottawa, Trenton, Ontario, which is near Toronto, London, Ontario, Edmonton. But always, uh, whatever wherever we lived, we spent our summer on Pender. So Pender had a very fond memories for me. And it was the one place that was constant for my family. And then uh, when I was 13 and in high school, it was offered to uh, certain students that they could be exempted from exams if they had plans of some sort. And so uh, I immediately thought of Pender and uh, the possibility of having a little summer job. So I applied to what was then called Scott's Lair. It was a brand new uh, resort in uh, Browning Harbor. It had just been built that year. I believe it was 1966. Uh, up until then, it was just, um, we called it Hamilton Beach, and I believe that technically is what it's still called, although most islanders don't remember that or don't call it that anymore. And we used to go to Hamilton Beach. It was kind of the night. We thought of it as the nice beach uh, because it wasn't so uh, rocky and full of barnacles. And we used to go over there and play a lot in the summers. And uh, always there was a, a summer picnic for Pender people, a big summer picnic with games and so on that we had in, at Hamilton Beach. And it was close by. I was going, I, I think I was uh, all of 13 years old. So I traveled out from London, Ontario and began work that summer, my first job. And that's now known as, um, is it Browning? They just call it Browning. Yeah. Browning they, Pub. Sure. Yeah. Um, but over the years, um, it's um, been owned by various people. The first owner was somebody, Dennis, from California. I worked for them. And then I worked for subsequent owners as well at other times. I also worked in the summer at, we called it Bedwell Harbor Resort. Um, and it's since been called Poets Cove and been quite, uh, quite a bit um, built up. So anyway, those were my jobs in the early, my early teens were on Pender Island. And then I went to university and eventually became a teacher. And the job that came available to me uh, in 1977, I'm feeling very old, was uh, in uh, Gold River on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And I went there and uh, was a teacher of various grades, but mostly uh, kindergarten and grade one. I stayed there for 22 years. Uh, that's where my children were born and uh, raised. And then in 1998, the mill simply closed because of world markets. The mill closed and everybody who worked there uh, was uh, laid off. And so we knew in August of 1998 that we were going somewhere, but we didn't know where. We just that we couldn't. Um, my husband had lost his job and uh, that we would have to move. And then just out of the blue, I, I uh, it was a small town. And so my children and I always went home for lunch. And uh, one day I was home at lunch, uh, cooking lunch for my kids. And I got a phone call from my mother to say that uh, she had been into the school and just was chatting with the uh, secretary and that they were looking for a kindergarten teacher kindergarten and special ed, and uh, that they had not found one internally. And so my mother phoned to say, I think this is it. I think you should apply. Um, but it, today is the closing. So that very afternoon, I had to uh, come up with a resume, which I, I had been in the same place for 22 years. I My resume had changed quite a bit since then, but I quickly put one together and applied, mostly to appease my mother, but also hoping, just kind of hoping that it might come to fruition. And that was sometime in January of 1999. And by February 1st, I was here on Pender, working um, at, the, at the school until actually two days from now, I will be retiring. So that's my long answer to how I came to Pender Island. 
All right. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot to unpack there. I didn't actually realize you had such a rich history with uh, the island until today <laughs> when we spoke on the phone earlier. But before we unpack that, I just want to ask a question about when you found out that you got the job to <laughs> work on Pender Island. What did that mean to you? Well, in 1994, so five years earlier, uh, my father became very sick and uh, ultimately did die. Uh, but he asked me, I'm one of five children, and he asked me if I would come home. And uh, at the time, I thought that was just an impossible thing, that I had two children and a husband, and we we both had jobs, and I just didn't think that it was at all possible. And, and he was meaning to, he knew that he wasn't going to survive and that he was hoping that I would come and be with my mother. So I just wanted to please him and to uh, for him not to be stressed when he was already very seriously ill. And I just assured him that I would and never dreamed that I ultimately would be successful. But it did take five years. Yeah. yeah. So when when you got the job, obviously, it meant a lot to you. It I did. Yeah. It did. Yeah. Right on. So to go back and to uh, talk about your father a little bit there, because it seems that it started with him looking at weather patterns, you said, and discovering that. He did. He was a young man from Scotland. And, and I'm not sure if you know, but Scotland it does not have great weather. <laughs> uh, it's just I've lived there. I, I lived there three times in my childhood. And it's just cold and rainy and, uh, you know, sunny days are few and far between. Uh, so he left as a young man. I believe he was only 17 or 18 and joined the uh, Royal um, Air Force and went uh, actually all over the world. But in his spare time, he was studying weather patterns. It just was something that was very interesting to him and had a dream that he would have a farm. He had been a city boy and just dreamed of almost a, a gentleman type of farm that he would one day own and began to save up even then. So that's... Wow. Yeah. And and you also said that no matter where your family was stationed within the country, that you would always come back to Pender every summer. We did. That's mm -hmm. remarkable. So yeah, was this did. your father's drive that uh, that made that happen? Or was it the whole family or... Well, it, he particularly loved Pender Island, uh, but my, I'm sure my mother did as well. Um, my mother was a city lady. That's, you know, we, we lived in large cities. And in fact, when they came to Pender Island, she just became a farm lady. She just had a transformation and just took to farming right away. He was more a gentleman farmer, building beautiful rock walls and fences and things like that. But she was the farmer and did farm until I believe she was 73 years old wow. when she broke her leg. Um, she broke her leg very badly. And that kind of was the beginning of the end of her farming. Uh, she had sheep and sheep take a lot of care. You have to make your rounds every day, walk and find them wherever they are and just count them and make sure that they're all in good shape and so on. And so she wasn't able to do that anymore. And it was the beginning of deciding to ultimately sell the farm portion of her land. And just for those people listening, uh, I know that your dad is deceased, as you told mm -hmm. me, but your mother is still alive on the island. And what are your parents' first names? Uh, my mom is Helen, and my dad was Bob. And he cared very deeply about uh, the island. We used to say that he was more Canadian than Canadians. He was so proud and grateful to be a Canadian, and especially to be a Canadian living on Pender Island. He was a very political person. So in his last decade or so, he served on the Island Trust, uh, and he very much uh, believed in preserving and protecting the islands and, and was willing to work for that. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right. So to uh, shift it back to your life here. So you talked about uh, spending 21 years in Gold River. I did. And for those people listening, where is Gold River? Well, you know, um, I was young uh, when I first accepted a job in Gold River. And uh, when I got off the phone, having accepted the job, I looked it up on a map. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I just, I just want, I had gone through my um, education at UVic and I wanted to teach. So I just took the first reasonable offer and that came and I had to look it up on a map. I was pleasantly surprised to find out that it was on Vancouver Island. I somehow thought, I, I don't know if I was confusing it with Golden, but I thought somehow it was inland. And there it was on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So that's that's how I got there. Okay. Just, it, it does sound kind of inland. When you first mentioned it, I thought that yeah. it was inland. But I was surprised to hear it was on Vancouver Island as well, too. But uh, we're exactly on the west coast of the island. So uh, Gold River is uh, directly west of Campbell River on the coast. And so it would be in between Tofino and um, to the north. Well, Port Hardy is at the end of the island. But yeah, Holberg. Port Alice are, are on the West Coast. So that's where it is. And you said that there was a mill there. So uh, logging was a big industry, obviously. Logging still happens, but the mill has uh, stayed closed. It has never reopened. Uh, but Gold River has uh, endured somehow. The fabric of that community has changed a bit. There was a time when it was very much a young person's town. So just to give you an example... I believe that right now on Pender, we have about 2,500 permanent residents. That's exactly what we had in Gold River in the days that when I was there. But we had 440 kids at the elementary school and 200 at the high school. Wow. It was a town full of young kids. It was just a wonderful place to raise kids. Just a great place. Okay. Well, can you tell us about your first year in the classroom, about what that experience was like for you, about your first year teaching? I've been thinking about that a little bit in the last few days. As I'm drawing it you know, to an end, I, I can't believe that 41 years have gone by. I guess I was very young. I don't know. I well, think I must have been. My first year, I had grade one and two. And that first year really was like Every other year that I've had teaching in that, kids are just captivating. They need you. They're, they have such a zest for life. And you just have to respond. You just have to. And also uh, that I was surrounded by teachers of different ages, as I still am, who uh, were so inspiring. I feel very uh, blessed to have had a whole career surrounded by amazing, just amazing, inspired people. Very hardworking. I, I learned that first year uh, that this was not a job for sissies, <laughs> that it was just about a lot of hard work. And that's what it has required all along. It's been worth it. Right on. So you talk about being inspired by other teachers. Is there anybody that stands out in mind to you that uh, you were inspired by? I kind of hate to single out anybody because there have been so many. But on my first day of school, I met a lady, uh, another grade one teacher, and I still communicate with her, who on a daily basis in my first year just just gave me lots of advice and lots of direction to move me along. And I'm very grateful for that. And I've tried to pay back. I've tried to do that for others. That's my hope anyway. Okay. Well, we'll we'll fast forward uh, from that time in Gold River into uh, teaching on Pender Island. And you have a, a long, long history of teaching on Pender Island kindergarten. Did you start teaching kindergarten on the I island? I came to take a kindergarten teacher and then a kindergarten position, which was only half time at, in those days. And then the other half of my job was special ed learning assistance. I just have a bachelor's degree, but I had had a lot of experience with special needs kids. And so that's why I um, was given that position, I believe. And how was it working with special needs kids? Because uh, my mother actually was a teacher and she did some special needs teaching herself. But um, just to hear it from your perspective about uh, how how was that as, as a job and an experience, let's say. <laughs> Gee, it's, it's hard to explain. It's just uh, all kids. I, I don't really see them as being different. All kids have challenges. All kids have strengths. They might have a little bit extended challenges, but all kids do. 
and they all have strengths. They all have things that they are able to do. So I don't know whether I would say that they were, that special needs kids are terribly different or that the job is terribly different. Any group of kids has just enormous needs that teachers are expected to respond to. And we do uh, to the best of our ability. Sure. Because as I said earlier, you have to, you have to respond. You're standing there in front of them and and you're running the show and um, pretty quickly you respond. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to warn you in advance. I got a lot of other questions about what it means to be a teacher. And part of the reason that I asked you to come in for an interview is because I just want to, uh, pay respect for all the work that you've done through your life as being a teacher because it's a pretty important role in the community and a pretty amazing service that you do. And I know it's a job, but just want to try to uh, spend a little bit of time here talking about it and letting you uh, reflect on your your time as a teacher because uh, it's something that I have a great respect for. Well, thank you. Yeah. So when you came to Pender and you you began teaching, did you notice any difference between the school here and the school in Gold River? Were there any changes that that you had to adapt to? And and what was your first impression of being a kindergarten teacher on Pender? Um, really, uh, Pender kids are just lovely. They're actually very easy children to teach, and so I just I I found it a very easy transition. And to be perfectly honest, I've actually only taught in two, well, three schools. So I had one uh, year in 2010, I went for one year to teach on Saturna Island. And um, that's a one room uh, schoolhouse. And that was just, I just always wanted to try that. I told you about the teacher that I met on my first day of school in Gold River and how she mentored me. Well, she would tell me stories about being in this place called Toba Inlet. It's up island um, on the mainland across from Campbell River. So near Knight Inlet is Toba Inlet. She had taught in a one-room schoolhouse, and it sounded almost kind of romantic to go and try to teach all these different grade levels. So I had that in the back of my mind. And then in 2010, I had the opportunity to go for a year. To Saturna, and I just, it was very unique and I really enjoyed it. So I've actually taught in three schools in my entire career, which is relatively unusual. Yeah, that does seem in 41 years, three mm-hmm. schools doesn't sound mm-hmm. like a lot, but it's good stability though. It is. Made yeah. for a stable, stable life. But how, how was that experience teaching in Saturna? How was it what you were expecting and what happened with that experience that you were not expecting? I suppose I hadn't expected that it would be such hard work. I I actually only had four children, but they were at different grade levels. And I always, I guess, have expected a lot from myself. Anyway, uh, they were, they, because you were able to give such instant feedback to every uh, assignment that they do, everything that they do, you can do so much more in a day. And it was a tremendous amount of preparation to get ready for four different grade levels for the kids to put in a very hard work day. Yeah, so it was. I wasn't expecting that. You, most people would say, oh, four kids, oh, gee, that's easy. Um, no, it, it was not. <laughs> it was not. And it was also hard to create a fun atmosphere because I've been used to large numbers. I've been used to classes of at least 18, you know, to 20 something. And then to suddenly have four, it felt kind of flat to me. Yeah. So it was quite challenging, but I, I'm just beautiful. I have a, really a lovely year. And I felt it was very satisfying. I felt that I was able to tailor every assignment specifically to that one child that it was designed for. It was just very satisfying. Sure. Yeah. I guess, you know, when you put hard work into anything, it's really satisfying. It is. Definitely, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, that is kind of funny, though, that yeah, I would I would think, four kids, wow, you got this made. Yeah. And it's also uh, quite isolating. Uh, in Gold River, I was, uh, I think we had 20-odd teachers on our staff plus support staff. Yeah, on Pender, I believe there's six or seven and support staff. So I had never been completely on my own. And that's quite isolating. I think I did okay because I was in 
the end of my or towards the end of my career. So I was able to go and survive without that mentorship. Okay, so you're yeah. just able to draw upon some skills that you learned in the past. Exactly. And, exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what uh, what made you decide that this year you were going to retire? What brought that decision on? Um, gee, a, a number of of different things. I I just decided that it was time to make the call before I'm too tired. I was trained as a music teacher, and uh, Kodai is a well known music educator. He had a a quote that I used to actually have taped on my desk. And it said that only the best of everything is good enough for young children. And um, it's time to pass the baton, uh, take it a little bit easier. I have actually worked very hard for a long time. And I have grandchildren and my own children. I want to spend some time with them. And I want to do it when I still have some energy. And uh, yeah, it's just time, but I'm not actually 100% retiring. So uh, my daughter is a teacher in Dawson Creek. This is another bit of a long story too. Go for so, it. <laughs> so in 1975, I was in, in, in the education faculty at U of X, and it was presented to the large group, my entire cohort. I'm not sure how many it would be, but maybe 500 education students that we could uh, join a special group, a Dawson Creek seminar, if we were interested, and that we would be going there to student teach and be offered, as long as everything went well, we would be offered jobs at the end of it. And this is in the days which, well, actually, most of my career, things have been very tight for teachers. Um, there were not a lot of jobs to go around, so it sounded very good to me. And I joined that Dawson Creek seminar, and it, it was getting towards the end of the year, just before we were going to be heading off to our um, student teaching gig. And at that time, it, I began to realize that I was going to get married. I hadn't planned on it, but that's what was going to happen. And I felt that it was kind of dishonest to go to Dawson, knowing that I wasn't going to be accepting a job at the end of the student teaching time. So I um, didn't go. But that interest was always there to, you know, to be in the North and just to experience what that was like. So that was in 1975 that I could have gone to Dawson Creek. Here we are. My daughter now teaches there. And so uh, I'm going to go spend some time with her and uh, do some uh, what we call TTOC, and so subbing in the schools there. So I'm finally going to go. Okay. <laughs> it's never too late. Dawson, yeah. Dawson's finally calling your name. Yeah. And you get to have you, I, so this is going to be your first time living in the north, I guess. Well, I lived in Edmonton, and uh, I lived in Edmonton a long time ago. And I believe the weather has changed a lot. Uh, it was really cold. But Dawson Creek is a pretty close to Edmonton. And I have been there, but in the summertime. Okay. So, yeah, I'll find out. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'll your daughter out. has been giving you some uh, some fair warning about what yeah. the weather's like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. So, you're going to get to uh, semi-retire and then go spend some more time with your daughter and your grandchildren? No, my son lives in Summerland. Okay. And that's where um, he has two little boys, and so I'll be spending some time with them. So okay. I'll, I'll kind of be going between Pender and Sydney. I have a house in Sydney. Pender, Sydney, Dawson Creek, Summerland, kind of back and forth. Okay, That's Travel. my plan. Yeah, bringing things back to Pender Island again here, and, and just realizing that you have two more days to go. How are you feeling? How are you feeling about two more days of being a full-time teacher? And and what, what, what does that mean to you right now? Um, when I made the call, so I decided to do this about early May, maybe even April. When I made the call, my heart wasn't in it at all. It was just kind of the intelligent thing to do. We have a level where you reach that you're, you've hit maximum. So I've contributed my maximum amount to my pension. And it's, I, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm ready financially to, to go. But I made that call and my heart wasn't really in it because you know what? I'm so lucky from the day that I started. And I think until the day that I'm done, I just have loved my job all along. Not that it hasn't been really hard work and lots of grief along the way, um, but just a, a very satisfying and I just 
I, I just have uh, such admiration for all of the people in the system. So as time has got closer to my retirement, I've been really warming up to the idea. I mean, when you work for that long, it feels strange to even anticipate that you're not going to be. But now I'm starting to really think about the possibilities that I have the freedom to go and visit my children and try different things. And uh, I don't have to be bound so much by uh, such a schedule. So that, I'm looking forward to that. Right on. Yeah. And what advice would you give to a new teacher coming in next year, for instance, what, or a teacher in the system right now? From your experience of being a teacher for this long, what sort of advice would you uh, impart on other people? Gee, uh, just be prepared to work hard. The kids need you. You're the only teacher they have, and they need you to, to give your best work. Uh, but at the same time, to have a life, put parameters around it, decide at a certain time every day that, you've, that you're done, that you've done as much as you can today, and go home and enjoy your life a little bit. Uh, and definitely uh, always keep your family as number one. But yeah. It's kind of uh, an awesome question. I, In a way, I don't feel really qualified to say, you know, what do I say to a new teacher? I, I don't know. No, that's, yeah. that, that's fair you enough. You find your way. You find your way. Yeah. No, oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Right on. And with the extra time that you're going to be having now that you're no longer teaching, what do you plan on doing with your spare time? What are you excited about uh, engaging in in your uh, spare time now? Well, um, I'm an avid reader, and I feel at different times, but I feel almost reading deprived, um, that I don't get enough reading time. And so I, I plan to spend a lot of time with my face in a book. I'm a mediocre musician. Uh, I have played much more in the past than I currently do. Um, but I'd like to get going again and, and get into music again and I play for fun. Not really looking much beyond that. Okay, well, what, what do you play? I play flute. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, so reading books and playing flute. Sounds That's delightful. It. Right on. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to bring it into the second traditional question that we always get to on this program, and it is, who has helped you along the way on Pender Island? Well, um, very quickly uh, comes to my mind my mother. Um, really, my mom has been a very, very good friend all of my life. And, you know, in this last 20 years, when, when I uh, found out that I was successful and did get a job here and that my kids didn't want to follow, they were in their last years of high school and coming out of a very small remote town and wanted to hit the big city. So they decided that they didn't want to come. And it was very nice to be not just uh, allowed, but enthusiastically uh, welcomed into my mother's house. And I've actually been there for 20 years, traveling back and forth. And my kids did go to the city, and uh, it didn't take them too long, uh, about a decade of uh, city life. And they both decided that they want to live in a small town. Interesting. Yeah, and you sound really proud about that, that your kids have wanted to live in small We places. just, we found that life in a small place was so much richer, and there's a feeling of connectiveness, that you're connected to your uh, your community and being part of it, and there's also some accountability to live your life well, because you know so many of the people that who surround you. Yeah, so we we all uh, agree wholeheartedly that life in a small place is so much richer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Just the other day, actually, well, maybe a few weeks ago, uh, my wife and I went to go watch the kids play baseball, and subsequently, they've gone on to win a lot of games and won the championship. And the Pender Pirates are uh, heroes. But it's it was so nice to look out on the fields and recognize a lot of the kids and then look in the stands and recognize a lot of the parents and talk mm. to the parents. And and it's such a lovely experience to be on the island to uh, to have a simple pleasure like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's uh, one of the small benefits that small community provides. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. But so the person who's helped you the most along the way on the island is your mom. I would say without a doubt. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Yeah, and you said that you spent 20 years living at her house because you traveled back and forth. So I um, 
when I decided that I was ready to buy somewhere um, in this area, I decided that I would buy uh, on the Victoria side. So I've had a few places. I'm trying to experiment in with where I like to live the most. And um, I've settled on Sydney. So that, I've had a house now just for five or six years in Sydney. Okay. The other thing I wanted to touch on as well, too, is we uh, spoke a little bit before the interview and I asked if there's anything in your life that you wanted to speak to during this interview. And you mentioned a uh, connection to Aboriginal communities uh, mm -hmm. within Gold River. And I'm just giving you an opportunity to talk about that right now. Yeah. Well, growing up, if I had Aboriginal people in my classes, I didn't recognize them. I didn't know. I'm, I just didn't know. And then when I went to Gold River, there was a fairly high population of Aboriginal people. And I began to find out about them and join them for their community events. They were, they were very welcoming. And, you know, I was invited to celebrations of different kinds. And I, I wanted to do that because my students were part of it. And I wanted them to know that I was connected to them. Anyway, I learned uh, little bits along the way, and I would never claim to, even now, to say that I know very much. But I became, I guess, what you would call a friendly. So I wanted to promote them. They traditionally have had rather sad experiences at school, uh, unsuccessful. They felt uh, this is the generation after the residential schools where they didn't really feel that they were cared for or belonged. Many of the students weren't successful because of that. They were very capable, but that lack of connectedness just took them away from school. Anyway, so I became more and more involved with them, and I served on what's called the Island uh, Circle for my school district. And the people who attended that were mostly Aboriginal coordinators for their district. And we collected information. We uh, Sometimes we would hire exemplary teachers to uh, do work in a project for us because we had funding from the Ministry of Education. So I was part of that for a number of years. And then, uh, as I told you, out of the blue one day, I applied for the job in Pender Island. So I went to my uh, island circle meeting and said, uh, hey, uh, I'm leaving. I have a job. I'm, I'm not going to be in Vancouver Island West anymore. And they said, well, where are you going? And I said, the Gulf Islands. And they said, well, the Gulf Islands has always been part of our circle, but they've never had anybody in attendance. So if you go, ask your superintendent if you would be allowed to come. So when I got to uh, Pender Island, I thought, well, I should. It was met in a very positive way. It was told, absolutely, you can go and represent us. We would love that. And so at the very next meeting, I arrived and they said, oh. <laughs> and, I, and I explained that I was now the representative for the Gulf Islands. And when I left Gold River, I said to the uh, Aboriginal people there, I'm going to go and be your ab ambassador. I'm going to go try to teach people the things that I've learned from you. And I hope that I have done that. That's been my objective. Well, after a few years of serving on the um, Aboriginal Circle for the Gulf Islands, a position came up for the first time in the Gulf Island School District. They created a position called the Aboriginal Coordinator, and I applied for that and got it. So for a year or so, I um, began the work in the Gulf Islands to just bring um, Aboriginal issues and information and ways of knowing and thinking to all of the students in the Gulf Islands. And then uh, part of that was we were given the um, opportunity and the work to do to create a, what's, what's called an enhancement agreement for the school district and between the school district and the Ministry of, of Education. And I worked on that for uh, I think three years, and then we published um, the first enhancement agreement for the Gulf Island School District. Since then, there have been two more, and I believe that's evolved, and we no longer have an enhancement agreement. It's called something else, but I've kind of lost. Uh, I'm not as involved 
other people have carried that work on. And I've been very happy for them to do that. And I've tried to support them in the sidelines. I feel like that's part of what I accomplished as in my teaching career. Sure didn't look, you know, I don't know, 45 years ago, if you had asked me what I would do when I was teaching, I, I would never have dreamed because I knew nothing. And um, I just found it very interesting, very compelling. Uh, I was very drawn by their need. They were so gracious in teaching me. And if you knew that the uh, feeling towards schools and that they still had a heart to connect with a teacher was amazing. I appreciate that even more now than I did then. But I, I feel like that's one accomplishment in my teaching career, kind of aside from my work with the kids in the classroom, uh, that I'm proud of. I'm, I'm happy that I was involved in that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I'm hearing from you describing that situation, it sounds to me as if that there is a really a strong respect from them coming towards you and that you received a really very warm feeling. And, and it's interesting when things pop into our lives and we make decisions to go further down the road to pursue them. I think a lot of times it's just based on a, a warm feeling that we have and we're not exactly sure why we're following it. But it sounds as if you were really greeted with a lot of warmth from these people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and just to clarify, the enhancement agreement specifically means... It was a plan. It was a, a five-year plan to improve the, the school life of all Aboriginal students, but also to increase the awareness of Aboriginal culture, issues, understandings, thinking. We wanted to improve the awareness of all students. And so it was a plan to put those things into place over a period of time. And it was done with a committee, uh, school district employees, and uh, people from the Aboriginal community. Okay, fair yeah. enough. And as well, too, you mentioned uh, earlier when we spoke that you were given a gift because of your role in... I was. And uh, so what happened, uh, I think it was maybe about 1995, we would always, at the end of the school year, we would have an Aboriginal celebration and education night uh, on the reserve, and teachers would be invited, and we would try to honor uh, all of our students in, in various ways and give them rewards and so on. So on one of these Aboriginal nights, I was called up to the stage, and they thanked me for my work and gave me a stick. And um, I didn't get it, um, but, you know, I liked their kind words. And they said, no, don't you lose that stick. So I went home and put it in a cupboard. And then the following year, it was Aboriginal night. You know, I, I was part of the planning. I would help get food together and so on. And they said, and don't forget to bring your stick tonight. So I wondered about that. Anyway, that evening, uh, they called me up, asked me to bring my stick. And I found out what that is. So the stick takes the place of a promise. It's a promise of something to come when they give that to you. And then you trade it when they're going to actually give you the gift, you trade the stick for the real gift. And what that was um, is uh, it's called regalia. So regalia, it looks, it depends on the um, Aboriginal people, it can look very different, but it's a dancing shawl and a headdress. And so mine is made out of cedar and on the back of the shawl, there's a large eagle. An eagle honors uh, education, so wisdom. And underneath the eagle, there are two whales because the way that they separate their, you've probably heard of tribes or clans or houses. So they uh, spoke of houses, but it means the same, clan or tribe. And so I was essentially adopted into the whale house. And that's a particular family. What happens there is that at um, usually uh, kind of the coming of age, age of a, of a child, around 13 or 14, they are given their dancing regalia. Um, little girls, when you go to a, a big event, 
the little girls wear tea towels. They're pinned to their back, and that's their dancing shawl. And then at some point, they're given their regalia. So a little bit late in life for me, but I was given regalia. And you can't uh, buy it. You'll never see it for sale anywhere. It is designed by your grandfather and uncles. So they decide on the design. And then the aunties and grandmother actually sew it. It So it has lots of little sequins. That's how the design is nowadays anyway. It used to be they would be decorated with shells. But nowadays it's sequins. Buttons, you probably heard of button blankets. Same kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. What did that mean to you to receive that gift? Uh, well, it's a total honor. And uh, last week was June twenty first as Aboriginal Day, and so I have it in. I have my regalia in a box, and I haven't been, you know, back to Gold River for twenty years. But I hauled it out, and I thought I'm wearing it to school because it is an honor, and I I see myself as an ambassador, and it identifies me with them. So to be given that meant that I was included as part of their family. Uh, And that, you know, I'm I'm just amazed. I'm completely humbled by the thought that they would extend that, that to me, to be included as part of their families. It's amazing. Yeah, sure. That's definitely a huge honor. Yeah. Yeah. You did some, you did some good work. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, uh, so I tried to haul it out once a year because One of the reasons they gave it to me was that I used to go dancing every Thursday night or something, and I would always wear a tea towel like the little girls, and they would laugh. They thought it was funny. So it was time for me to have something proper. Oh, that's great. Okay. Wow. So they they were watching. They were watching you. They knew. They knew what you needed. Yeah. Cool. So you mentioned about uh, Scotland earlier and uh, being Scottish. Any plans to go back to Scotland anytime soon? I kind of like to. Um, I haven't been, the last time I was there, I was nine. So, uh, yeah, I was there. I lived for uh, a little less than a year when I was three, six, and nine. The whole works about, we, we had five kids. So we'd all go back and descend on my grandparents and go between the two sets of grandparents for and visiting, you know. So I, I knew my grandparents well, although they lived in Scotland. Okay, so yeah. you said both sets of grandparents were. So you're 100% Scottish? Yes, yeah. Both my mom and dad are immigrants. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any uh, any immigrant stories to share from your uh, parents' experience coming in? or Just that my dad uh, grew up in the tenements and uh, with very few um, prospects and decided to join the RAF and, and then saw the world and decided that uh, Canada was the best country in the world, which I still, I believe, I agree with him, and that he was going to emigrate to Canada, and he did. And he came, he arrived with uh, very little money and, and just a kit bag and just an intention to um, find his place somewhere in Canada. And uh, he originally went to Northern Ontario, which, as you know, I mean, it has its own beauty, but uh, not compared to here. <laughs> It, it does. It has its own beauty. It does, it does. And, uh, but he made his way to uh, Kelowna, and, um, and that's where he, uh, he began his family. But he knew my mom from Scotland. They, they were family friends. They knew each other. Um, and so he came a, a couple of years ahead of her, and then she followed him. Um, but they did know each other in Scotland. Their families knew each other. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, so my grandmothers were very good friends. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's amazing. very nice. Yeah. yeah that, I've never heard that before. Oh. No, that's that's a pretty unique story. And I think that as time goes on, it's going to become even more and more unique of a story. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. And in terms of different places, you said that you spent a lot of years traveling, living in different places in Canada. Where was your favorite place to live in Canada when you were a child? Well, not Edmonton. <laughs> Um, well, you know, kids have different, um, ways of measuring things. Uh, You know, I was just, we were very much, we stayed very close to home. We were, there were four girls and we were pretty timid and not, you know, not very brave. So we didn't really go far. And then we had a younger brother and he he was a quiet, quiet boy. And so home was just home and it, it almost didn't matter where you lived. I think I probably liked Trenton, Ontario, ab- about the most. Where is Trenton, Ontario? Trenton's about a um, hundred miles 
from Toronto. Yeah, at southern so southern Ontario. It's very it's very lovely there. And what was it that made it so I'd, memorable? I'm, for I'm, you? I'm trying to think of why Trenton stands out. It was just a nice little town. Um, you know, maybe it was a grade level. I think I was there for grade four and five, something like that. So maybe I just had lots of connections to my friends. I I recently went back to Trenton. So just a couple of years ago, I went back to Trenton and I remembered a big, long hill from my house down to the school. And so I went to try to find it. And it was just a little hill, (laughs) just a little hill. And my school was completely gone. And I know that I had the right place. It's now an old folks' home. Um, <laughs> yeah. But one day when I, I, no, I was in grade two in Trenton. Anyway, I was on my way home with my report card and I got D in printing. In, in, in grade two, we got A, B, C, D. It doesn't make any sense, but because I was just a terrible printer. And so on the way home at the little grocery store, I threw my report card in the garbage. And then continued on home. And of course, when I got there, everybody else had a report card. And my mother said, where's yours, Helen? Um, and I had to fess up that it was in the garbage. But I tell my kids at school that because they, they're amazed. They say, you got D in printing? Because I'm quite a good printer now. But I tell them that to kind of give them the idea that like what you see right now isn't forever. And if you're not a great reader right now, don't worry, because you can be. Because they're just amazed that I got D in printing. But anyway, <laughs> that was Trenton. And yeah. it wasn't such a big hill. Yeah. No, it's funny how we remember things so differently from childhood to yeah. just how everything seemed so much longer, bigger. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it totally is not. It's just our, yeah. our, our little kid imagination. So it's really interesting to go back. And that's why I actually would like to go back to Scotland. And it's so interesting. You can, uh, on Google Maps you can actually zero in on uh, houses. So one night I, I was explaining to my husband that we lived along the water in this place called Sandbank near um, Danoon and um, Port Glasgow. Danoon and Port Glasgow are known as the Twin Cities. They're just separated by a bridge. And then we were along the coast. So, and I was explaining to him about how far, and my my grandmother's house was red. It was red brick, and we found it. Oh, wow. It still stands. Wow. This big red brick house. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's just so interesting to be able to do that. Right? It is. It is. I've yeah. done that with different places I've traveled to, and it's, it's, uh, it's weird. Because that's awesome that it's still there, and it's still the same. Yeah. You know, as time goes on, things change so rapidly. I guess that gives you more motivation to go back and to yeah, see it. Yeah, I would like to see it. And I remember the addresses. I, I don't know why um, they stick in your mind, but I remember one grandmother lived at 13 Mills Road. So I'd love to just go back and I, I'm sure I could find it. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you can find it on Google Maps, I'm and sure you And then down find a it. huge hill to the other grandmothers, but it's probably just a little, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just, it's just a flat road now, actually. It's mm-hmm. a, that's all, that's all it ever was. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we're nearing the, uh, we're nearing the end of our time here. Yeah. That went by really fast. It did. Yeah. But is there anything else that you want to talk about? Anything else that you're thinking of that's on your mind that you want to speak to? No, no, no. I'm just glad for all the years that I've, I've been blessed to live on Pender Island, and and I think I'll always come back. But yeah, and then looking forward to moving on. For sure. Well, you know, I just want to give my uh, my own appreciation to you for uh, forty one years of being yeah. a teacher, Thank and uh, and almost half of those of uh, teaching the kids on Pender Island. And yeah. I think uh, I think you've had such an impact on so many people's lives, and. Yeah, I'm happy you were able to come in and share some stories with us and uh, we can put this out to the uh, people of Pender Island and have a, have a permanent record of uh, some of your words to share with us. So thank you so much for coming in, Helen. Thank you. All right, have yeah. a great night. Okay. All right, well, there you have it. And in honor of that interview, I decided I'd come down to the obvious place. And that is the Pender Islands Elementary School. So... Right now, I'm just walking through the large field that's off to the side of the school, and it's surrounded on all sides by forest. It's really green and lush out right now in the early summer. 
off to the corner of the property away from the school. There's a hockey rink with some basketball hoops set up as well, too. You regularly see adults playing some hockey in there during the summertime. There's a Cobb building just off to the side of that and also a school garden as well, too. And the school is located on the left-hand side as you're driving down towards the bridge that connects the North Island to the South Island. And it's kind of hard to miss as you're driving by because it's this really beautiful, natural environment, it looks like, and a really, really nice looking older building and what appears to be a pretty nice place to go to school every day or go to work every day for Helen for the last 19 years. Thank you all very much for listening. Until next time.